presidents. Okay, I'm going to start this rotation of grades in the 89. Um, if I read the number, say a number different what's up there, read that one because I'll switch numbers around. Uh, when I phone Terry Gompart in Nebraska, I switch a couple numbers around if I don't pay real close attention. And I get the Pizza Hut in Nebraska and they won't deliver. <laughs> Okay, so from in 98 we took our first holistic course from Larry Pettit and uh, I went till 2003 trying to prove him wrong and I tried to finally give up and took the second course. Then we took one day course from Amos Lines and then the next course was from Terry Gompart and I'd sat in and put a few of Terry's uh, presentations that he uh, We've done a lot together the last few years. Now this is uh, land that the bank took on us and it was seeded the same day. This was conventionally grazed, then it said idle for 10 years and that's what it looked like. Next picture. And that was seeded the same day a half a mile away. But I was using this for my AI pasture when I was in the purebreds and it get hit really hard every year for a short time and if there wasn't enough grass there I fed on it and that's the difference and I never noticed this before because I was too busy looking at the cows and worrying about everything else. Okay, There's the regrowth on it after it was ate right to the ground. Next one. There it is. Okay, next. That was the regrowth on it with no cattle. See it never even produced seed. It's so unhealthy that land. There's nothing living in there hardly at all. Okay. This quarter section, okay, a quarter section is 160 acres. This is just one of my paddocks. We sprayed it in 95 with Roundup. This is when we were still conventional. We seeded it, harvested it, and I broke it up, and I seeded it to fall rye, and I combined it for the next year, and just about got nothing out of it. So Leonard talked me into just letting it grow back to, uh, well, they're not weeds, they're called forbs. Makes you feel better. <laughs> but I, I spent, spent uh, $2.94 on this. Okay, those yellow flowers there, you get south thistles down here? Okay, well this is the south thistle, it grows about this tall, and when they're coming to flower, they're higher protein than alfalfa. Most weeds are better than quality and protein than some of your grasses. So you can see um, where I use the gyro more. Right there, and there I put an alley down the center. And there's the cows. Okay, next one. I had uh, 10,500 pounds of beef per acre on that. Uh, back then, the instructors told me that was really high stock density grazing. And when I did this, we lived on the road this way, uh, half a mile. There's a mile and a half on that side to a road, two miles over here, half a mile over here, and a mile here. And this is a, there's a dead end road here, so we, I kept the fence shut all summer. So from a distance, this looks like I had them out in a canola field. And the neighbors didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't want them up there because I knew it wasn't going to work. So, okay, I come out, okay, take the next person. That tree there, it's an old uh, uh, farm site. And I come out every day and take a uh, picture there the first day. You can see the building in the ground, background. You can see a bit of fall rye that had grown here. Okay. Day three. Okay. There's four, and there's one year later, okay, and that's two years later. Those seeds that I planted, they had sat in the bin from when Dad had them 10 or 15 years before, I think. I don't know how old they were. I didn't have money to spend it. The only thing I did see grow was some Timothy. Other than that, it was more or less a field good project. I, I uh, just spread it to field good, okay? Now this is what it looks like 12 years later. That is uh, the sun on ma that makes it look silver, but it's actually alfalfa. And this real fine grass, 
It is coming in on me as a native Kentucky grass, and later in the year, it is higher sugar content than what my alfalfa is. And what I'm finding is I do a lot of sugar testing with the bricks tester, and I'm finding all different species coming at different times of the year. So the more species you got in your your uh, grass or in your field, you get different highs all the way through. And I'm finding that. What are the sugars on your grasses? What are, What's the sugars on your grasses? Your bricks reading. Oh, he asked what the sugars were on my, my bread trees. Um, my highs, I'm getting as high as 23s, 25s now. But they weren't there. I don't know what they were before, but I know they weren't that high before. But my lands get, the healthier my land gets, the higher the sugars are going. And what I'm finding now is, that you can tell when you move the cows how high the sugar is because you get them up and move them, they start kicking and bucking and it looks like a rodeo. And this last little while ago, I showed you where that land was dead in the road there, well I grazed that off, and they were out in the pasture. I have these lifters, I'll show you later, but I lifted the wire, let them out on the road, and I drove down the road with a quad, to put a fence across the road halfway down, and I would turn around up behind me, I got 700 head of cattle coming at me, kicking and bucking, and they stopped when they got to the fence and all of a sudden they turned around and went back as hard as they could. I figured they were going out in the neighbor's crop. They turned and went back in the field. They didn't get any grazing there. They just tramped, just flattened it right to the ground. So the next morning I went out, I got them up and moved them in the field and they started kicking and bucking and as soon as they settled down I lifted the wire and walked out and grazed. But when the sugar's high, they just like kids in the can. Okay? And there's some more, that's, uh, oh, I think it's red clover that's coming in, it's in the lower spots, this is spilling in too, and that's, most of that's just grow back. Okay? Okay, the impact of stock density, okay? Okay, this is, uh, when I was doing lower stock density, do you have Canada the thistle down here? Okay, well this is Canada the thistle here. You turn them into it just when it's coming to bud. And the next picture. Okay, I had 330 heifers there, 47 uh, animals per acre. I think that's 30,000 pounds or so. Uh, and see the bush there? This is on wildlife land. This is something like your CRP land. It's set aside for and not let not. They have animals on it, and I talked to them to put animals on it. And then, well, there's the, the wildlife, oh, go back the other way. One more of that. They like to see, the wildlife guys like to see this so you can't see in. And I think they're dead wrong because uh, back when that was like that, the only time you'd ever see a deer out there is when it was really miserable, 40 blow and blowing wind, they would go into that. And other than that, you'd never see them. But what happens? That's what? See here how they ate off all the uh, tops off the thistles. And the next picture, that's two days later. Next one. That's one year later. See if they're still there. See how yellow they are? Next one. See the bushes start to open up a bit. You keep going. That's what it looks five years later. See how the bushes all opened up? And what's well, just not, and what's happening there is I'm getting a browse line in the first few years it fills in with a lot of uh, grass and then a few years later it just fills in with all these uh, these legumes and veggies and what's happening is I'm laying uh, all the litter the dead litter with the higher stock density I knock it on the ground and they step on it and they recycle all that carbon faster. And last year was our second driest year in 22 years. And uh, where I had this, well, okay, I call this bush. A lot of trees. That land there where it had a lot of trees instead of being open, it carried 50 to 60% more carrying capacity than the open fields. Because those trees are bringing out nutrients and that and dropping it on the ground, all the leaves and that, and recycling all the nutrients from deeper below. And the cattle are trapping it in, and it's, 
it's being staying moist and that, and it's just getting healthier all the time. Okay? You can see some of the um, vetch is not. Can you guys see, are those good clear pictures back there or not? They don't look clear to the pictures to me. Are they out of focus? Is that better? Yeah, it does. It looks fuzzier up there than it does down there. Yeah. Yeah, that does. the focus? Is that better? Okay. Okay, next one. See the native, the vetch is not showing up in my class. And now I've got, in that land there on a half section, I've got uh, over a hundred deer wintering in there now. The thing that's happening is I'm getting more wildlife. I've got leopard frogs. I haven't seen them since I was a kid. There's more wildlife now on my land than there's ever been. Okay? That's what it looks like out there in the wintertime. That isn't cows, that's deer, deer in the bush, pawing in. Okay? Okay, let's do the high stock next to grazing. This will happen to you. And the only place it happens is right beside the main road. Okay? <laughs> uh, I'm kind of a community service at home there. They talk about me and leave the neighbors alone. So, this is in 07. This post in the next one. That'll be in the next slide. Now, whoop, it's back. Okay, you see how this is all soupy? I got to move them across the main road, and it turned out that I got to have help to get across the main road. So, Barb was there, so we moved them at night and put the 800 head on a on an acre, and that's what it looked like the next morning because it was wet to start with, and then it poured rain all night. And I wouldn't mind doing this well a third of the farm every year, as long as they're only there for a short time. It doesn't matter as long as you give it enough recovery time after that. Okay. Next one. Okay. Another one. Another one. Okay. One more. I think it's 87 day recovery. That's the same place. See here, there's the odd bit of foxtail. I look at the foxtail over here where it wasn't done to. Okay. Okay, an APA is an animal day per acre. Um, it's a holistic way of figuring carrying capacity out. That means one acre would handle 54 yearlings for one day. Or one, one animal for 54 days. It's the same thing. So I got 54 ADAs. I heard about this skim grazing and I thought I'd try it. And nobody knew what it was, so I just took a stab at it. So I got 54, and then the second time I got 76 for 131. And when I started on this field the first year, I got 23. Okay, next one. And this is what I learned compaction is a result of time spent in an area, not the number of pounds of animals. Okay? That there is one million pounds of beef per acre. Uh, went to church one day and they were quizzing me about how many pounds of beef and how many head I had and I told them I had 800 and some head on uh, 833 weights, 800 and some head on of 833 weights on a half an acre. It worked out to be uh, 1.3 million pounds of beef per acre. And the farmers, oh, you can't put that many head on that small piece of land. And so uh, I says, well, sure you can. All you got to do is point in the same direction. <laughs> and then later on that day when I was leaving church, I could hear the guys talking in the corner and about what I was doing. And the one guy that lives south of me, he goes to church two hours earlier than I do. And uh, he says, well, I did come by there this morning. They were pointed all the same way. But what happened was, I was moving without my bat latches, and I was out there, and I moved the cows, and they went all through the gate, and they were all headed back down the new paddock. And they just got to the far end of the paddock, and they were all pointed the same way. So the story around the water, that was that I 
Of course, I tell it all the same way.